Okay, uh, hello everyone. It is noon. Uh, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so for those of you, this is my first time moderating the ATI seminar series. So, so for those that uh, don't know me, I'm uh, Ben Adam. I'm a pathologist at the U of A hospital and it's my pleasure to moderate today's session. Um, I just want to start with our uh, land acknowledgement. So the University of Alberta acknowledges that we are located on uh, Treaty 6 territory and respects the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Nation uh, and, all, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. Um, and I also want to say a thank you to Paladin for their support of the ATI seminar series. Um, so uh, yeah, it's my, my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today. He doesn't really uh, require an introduction, but um, uh, I'll, I'll read the, the bio here that I've been provided. So Dr. Phil Halloran is a transplant nephrologist. He received his MD from the University of Toronto and his uh, PhD in immunogenetics from the University of London. He was a professor at the University of Toronto before joining the University of Alberta in Edmonton as director of nephrology. He was the founding editor of the American Journal of Transplantation and is currently a distinguished professor of medicine. His research focuses on the molecular phenotype of organ transplant rejection and organ injury and the translation of that knowledge to diagnostic systems to change care. He has published 375 original peer reviewed papers and is a member of the American Society for Clinical Investigation, a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada and an officer of the Order of Canada. Um, so the, the the topic of his presentation today, I believe, will be um, on uh, uh, the molecular microscope diagnostic system, reading rejection and injury in liver, lung, heart, and kidney transplant biopsies. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Dr. Halloran. Thanks very much, Ben. I appreciate it. And uh, thanks very much to the audience. And I just should say in, in advance that uh, the success that we have um, is dependent on this environment that we have. It's a very special environment. Uh, this is one of the world's great uh, transplant uh, centers, an environment for doing transplant science, and it depends on a lot of people, and I'm very grateful for the privilege of working with you people. This is the team we have, and uh, my job is just to talk to people about the work that very smart people do, and uh, I'm really grateful for this uh, team including uh, Louis Hidalgo uh, at the University of Wisconsin and uh, Kieran uh, in the pulmonary division. Almost everything I uh, am saying today is, um, is in the peer review process. Uh, the heart work is actually subject of a review which is undergoing uh, revision for transplantation. It's exempted pending revision. And the, uh, the last, the, uh, the kidney clad work, some of it is, uh, is just being submitted now. But these papers, in other words, there's a background of publications if you don't get the message the first time through. So we'll talk about the MMDX system and I'll just highlight a few uh, aspects of rejection that we're interested in. And one is the fact that there's a subthreshold antibody mediated rejection that we've become interested in in kidney and there's DSA negative antibody mediated rejection. And cell-free DNA has strong correlations with active rejection, even when the DSA is negative. Um, and that'll come into our interpretation of hearts. Um, then I'll talk about the endomyocardial biopsy and what we're seeing there, and then the uh, transbronchial biopsy and the mucosal biopsies that Karen Howard introduced. Um, and uh, I'll show you what we're seeing there. And finally, I may have time to get into some um, report of the, what we're seeing in the trifecta studies. Now, our general approach to uh, molecular biology of uh, organ transplants is to discover the underlying rejection states, but also the parenchymal injury states. Remember the kidney, the kidney patient, the heart patient, et cetera, they've come to you for parenchyma. And we want to find out as much as we can about the molecular biology of organ injury. We want to recalibrate the existing diagnostic systems and basically everyone to reach the right decisions about people to make MMDX available to clinicians as a platform. And this, uh, there's a lot of uh, biopsies being done in the United States and the MMDX system being run out of Portland and we're establishing a European center now too. And finally, comparing the MMDX biopsy findings to other biomarkers like cell-free DNA. 
So that's what the basis is of the trifecta studies. And we'd like to welcome you eventually, all of the organs into the trifecta studies of kidney and heart and uh, lung and liver. And the trifecta studies look at centrally measured donor-specific antibody measured by one lambda, uh, cell-free DNA measured by Natera, and the MMDX phenotype of the biopsy. And the first report from the trifecta was just out in JSON. All right. Um, as a clinician, uh, my approach to biopsies is biopsy if necessary, but don't necessarily biopsy. Uh, the major, it, the biopsy is for me the major site for discovery of human disease mechanisms. You just can't do anything until you understand what the tissue is doing, and it has to be molecular as well as histologic. Uh, it's the site for definitive diagnosis, and if the biopsy is necessary, please optimize the utility of the biopsy by doing as much as possible with this little bit of human that someone has given you. Now, when I deal with biopsies as a clinician, I know the problems of sampling, and I'm always you must remember that, and that's particularly a problem in IRB-approved uh, research protocols, where you're limited in the amount that you can get by the uh, institutional review boards. So we have to deal with small samples in our research level. There's also intrinsic variability within the tissue, like kidney medulla versus cortex, and there's a lot of variability in some of the biopsies, like the lung biopsies are really very noisy. There's a non-specificity of features. Uh, so we're always looking to, to, to define disease states, but we have to look at features which are not intrinsically specific, like intermolar arteritis can be a variety of things. And then assigning categories, Remember, what you're trying not to do is just put patients into a bucket. You have it or you don't. You're trying to actually establish the quantification and the probabilities. And around the boundaries, there are errors. Systems that rely on pattern recognition have particular problems with errors. And this is x-ray interpretation, any form of, of uh, and histology, any, anything in which one human individual has to make a qualitative decision about a pattern has the potential for inter-individual variation. But there are other errors too, errors within the rules we use, errors within the algorithms. And finally, when looking at um, a uh, diagnostic system, you have to understand your platform. Every platform has intrinsic limitations. There are weak phenotypes, there are effects of treatment. Was the patient treated? Has the treatment uh, affected the phenotype I'm observing? Maybe there are multiple diseases. Maybe there are rare phenotypes that, um, that, that you haven't seen before, that the reference set that you're referring to hasn't seen before. And maybe there's massive damage beyond the range of the diagnostic system. So when there's massive damage, often diagnostic systems go wonky. So the micromicroscope system is a central biopsy diagnostic system that, that uh, uses genome-wide microarrays to measure gene expression in intact RNA that's been preserved in RNA later. We don't use formalin fixed RNA because formalin um, irreversibly damages the, um, RNA, the RNA to some extent. Our measurements are very precise. There's greater than 99% uh, um, precision. And we compare the biopsy to a reference set. Usually, um, we're trying to get thousands of biopsies in the reference set. It's like a human memory. And we use ensembles of predefined machine learning algorithms to do that. We measure 50,000 probe sets. We interpret the injury states and their severity. We're looking for TCMR, ABMR. We're trying to infer non-adherence, and we can do that to some extent. And then uh, the wounding states, recent parenchymal injury, severe injury, a tissue in distress, a tissue at risk of failure, measuring irreversible injury atrophy fibrosis and predicting the possibility of progression. So you take a bit of human, you put it in RNA later, you put it in FedEx, uh, or you walk it over to us, um, and then, um, we receive it uh, usually overnight. We then extract the RNA from the biopsy. We put a label on the patient's RNA from the biopsy. We hybridize that to the chip. We then develop the label into a, quanti a quantity between uh, signals, let's say of 10 to 60,000. And then the, 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 we get uh, uh, 50,000 numbers coming off the, um, the, the array and it's sort of a spreadsheet. At that point, our software algorithms um, turn that into a report. 
Now, why microarrays? Why not RNA sequencing? RNA sequencing is a much better discovery system, but it is not suitable for reading single biopsies yet. And it's a batch technology. We use RNA sequencing at times, and we will probably use it more in the future. But right now, we need something which is very stable, has very stable um, supply of, re of the key reagents, and isn't going to be withdrawn. And I could tell you stories of why we have learned uh, to be very cautious about going to new systems that might be withdrawn. Now, the truth is out there. The conventional systems estimate the truth, and, and we do as clinicians as well. Molecular assessments are estimating the truth. We can use many, many algorithms, many different machine learning algorithms. It's like having a biopsy read by 100 pathologists when you use 100 different machine learning algorithms to interrogate the 50,000 measurements. The goal is not to agree with the conventional system. It's to discover as best as you can the truth and then describe its relationship. You can't agree with a system that has some intrinsic noise like in conventional, uh, like low kappa values. So you must remember not to try to over agree with something which is noise. And finally, we're now bringing in the biomarkers into this. So we want to see the relationship of the biomarkers to these other assessments, like don't derive cell free DNA. Now, no test is perfect. And we can't claim to be perfect, especially when you consider all the potential uh, errors that you can get from reading biopsies. And medicine is always discovering, and we're always learning more about these disease states. When MMDX disagrees with histology, we have some confidence that MMDX is likely to be correct. We look at more features, we look at them quantitatively, and, uh, and it's objective with high precision of the measurements. When we have a phenotype that can be predicted, MMDX predicts better than, uh, than histology, like survival. MMDX outputs are continuous, uh, not semi-quantitative or binary, which is especially important when you're looking around boundaries to have quantitation. MMDX trains classifiers on histology features. We love histology and we learn as much as we can from histology. We have, we're really derived from in parallel with the BAMP system, right going back to 1990, when Kim and I started these two different paths. Um, the MDX findings have been used to update the BAMP classification. For example, C4D negative ABMR and DSA negative ABMR really came out of the molecular systems. And then MMDX can assess recent injury and recent parenchymal injury. Really, the tissue is often histologically normal and is severely injured. Um, and, there are features which you can see with the microscope, with kind of focal microscopy, but very often you can't see those with conventional um, histology. More importantly, cell-free DNA measurements, which we think are a valid objective estimate of the probability of rejection are correlate better with MMDX than with histology. So we have confidence in the performance of the platform. Now, just remember, when you're looking at these results, the graft is not the whole story. A human is undergoing immune responses, and those adaptive immune responses are changing and changing and changing. And that's in relationship to the immunosuppression burden. And so you're seeing something that evolves over time, and a lot is going on underneath the tip of the iceberg that you see as a rejection episode. And secondly, human behavior. That's behavior of the patient and not taking the drugs, behavior of the clinician and trying to minimize the drugs. So non-adherence plays a role. This is a paper in which Joanna Solaris, when she was here, um, she looked at the biopsies we had and we tried to ascribe a cause of failure to organs that had failed. And we found that about 70%, 75% of the organs that failed, we could ascribe to an immunologic failure at that time, an immunologic cause. And when, we, when Joanna did chart reviews that were available, 50% of the patients had been recorded by the clinician independent of the study as having, been, having had concerns about adherence. And we think that this is probably an estimate, but it also means, listen, who on this call hasn't been non-adherent with the medication? There isn't anybody. So this is the way humans behave. It's not their fault. And secondly, a lot of the diseases come on despite the maximum adherence to. So don't regard this as being some sort of indictment of the humans 
involved, it is describing us. All right, T cell mediated rejection, antibody mediated rejection, and then these various injury states that, I, that we're focusing on now. And then the relationship between the rejection and injury states, that's what we're doing. Just everyone on the call probably knows this. Antibody mediated rejection is, is uh, at a molecular level, uh, emerges as an interaction between the NK cell the endo and the endothelium mediated by the CD16A FC receptor. But the, and the NK cell of the human, unlike the mouse, has a CD16A FC receptor, which is a remarkably sophisticated tool. It's like the T cell receptor. It activates calcineurin, it, it releases cytokines and gamma interferon, it, releases, it can release the cytotoxic enzymes. We don't know why the endothelium changes, but it does. It de-differentiates, and, uh, and, and over time, it starts to manifest some characteristic endothelial genes. So activity is largely related to the NK, the NK genes and the cytokine genes, particularly gamma interferon effects. But over time, the endothelial signal comes up as well. T cell mediated rejection involves a, an effect, a primed effector T cell, probably engaging antigen on a dendrite poking up through the endothelium, being guided across the endothelium, but not destroying the microcirculation. And then in the interstitium, whether this against COVID or against all antigens, the T cell undergoes a characteristic response in which it engages an antigen presenting cell. It activates the antigen presenting cell and activates the T cell. It releases the cytokines, which recruit many, many inflammatory cells. The number of cognate events is probably very small in a T cell mediated rejection episode. And the parenchyma de differentiates, it doesn't die. It's a de-differentiation state. It's very similar to in the kidney, like what we call AKI. Why it does, we don't know what exactly it is because there, there's a thousand signals which could be interacting with the endothelium. All right, um, sorry, going backwards. <laughs> So T cell mediated rejection is a very dynamic state. It's subject to exhaustion. And you're familiar with the uh, Nobel Prize for Medicine of 2018 and how this has changed cancer, but it should be changing transplantation because the T cell response is learning and changing every day. It produces immediate injury to the parenchyma, but remember that this may not reverse when T cell mediated rejection is reversed. And this is why T cell mediated rejection is probably a pretty damning thing to do to parenchymal cells. It can smolder. The episode may be the tip of an iceberg that goes on for years. Many T cell mediated rejection episodes reflect under immunosuppression. We can see that in the kidney because they're not properly hyalinized in the afferent arterial. And complete control uh, requires continuing full immunosuppression indefinitely, unfortunately. Now, antibody-mediated rejection we now recognize is about 50% DSA negative. And this is a problem. Um, so um, both histology and molecularly, we are now seeing the same thing. There are two types. There's the type one, which is presensitized, but we don't see that very much. We mainly see type two, and it's the common form of rejection. Probably 30% of all indication biopsies that we see have, have antibody-mediated rejection. It's mostly de novo antibody responses. It again can smolder for years and smolders below the level that we're actually calling rejection, either by histology or molecularly. It's, so again, it's the iceberg. It can also burn out late. It initially spares the parenchyma and may be well tolerated for years, but long-term it seems to produce atrophy fibrosis. And in some tissues we see specific glomerular features in, other, in, in, in kidney, but we, in other tissues we don't see the specific antibody-mediated chronicity change other than atrophy fibrosis-like changes. Okay, let's have a look, have a look at some hearts. The hearts. We're looking at the endomyocardial biopsies. We're looking at the rejection and injury states. And these are uh, the people who provided us with all of these hearts. And again, we're very great. We probably have, uh, we've got over 2000 biopsies now. And uh, uh, so first of all, in hearts, we look at TCMR, possible TCMR, ABMR, possible ABMR, and this new state we call minor. 
And we also identify recent inflamed injury. We see all these when we look at the rejection associated transcripts or rats. So the current biopsy report, which the Cashy Lab issues, um, shows the, the, new, uh, the new biopsy projected against the reference set. Now the reference set is expressed here in principal component analysis. The principal component analysis are rejection, uh, principal component one, ABM, TCMR versus ABMR is principal component two. This biopsy is in the non-rejection area, but it's not a perfect biopsy. And um, I get worried about these gray biopsies that are not over there to the left. And what's going on with those? When we take that cloud, this is a conical cloud of biopsies, and we rotate it so you can look down the barrel, you now see principal component three, which is acute parenchymal injury. And because the rats are, sh are shared between innate immunity and adaptive immunity, the most inflamed injury phenotypes in hearts give an injury phenotype that we can pick up with the rejection transcripts. So that's the report. This is a biopsy we read last week. Uh, here, this, this person has an anti antibody-mediated rejection phenotype. You see it's deviated in principal component one, it's deviated up in principal component two, and then when you rotate the cloud, it's deviated a little bit to the left in principal component three. So that's a fairly typical moderate antibody-mediated rejection. However, just to avoid making this any simpler, we decided, let's have a look at these biopsies that have a minor change. So we developed algorithms that generated the minor change, and this is published now. We decided to look at what these biopsies are doing. So now we have minor, as well as PABMR and ABMR, PTCMR, TCMR, recent inflamed injury, and no rejection. These are the, the normal biopsies. This is where I'd like my heart transplant to be if, if I had a heart transplant. And when we look down the barrel again, we see the, no, the recent injury coming out to the side and um, TCMR and ABMR, et cetera. And of course, the minor, uh, the minor is blending into the blob in the center. So what we're really looking at isn't buckets, it's gradients. So there's an ABMR gradient in the rats that goes from normal to minor to possible ABMR to ABMR. And there's a, there's a gradient in TCMR too from possible TCMR. How much low level TCMR there is, we're just looking at now. How much, is there low level cognate T cell activity in the hearts that we don't consider have any rejection? But there certainly is low level ABMR activity. So there's a gradient in ABMR gene expression, which drives that principal component one. It goes from, and that gradient in gene expression corresponds with the gradient in the probability that you'll be DSA positive. No rejection, normal is 24% DSA positive, minor is 34% and that's statistically significant. Possible is 42% and ABMR is 66%. And about a third of the hearts with fully developed ABMR have no DSA. So, and that's the picture that's very similar to what we see in kidneys. So hearts and kidneys are in parallel. We suspect it's going on in all the organs. Now, what about the failures? The X's here are plotting the failures on those endomyocardial biopsies. And what we see is, and this was really a shock. In fact, we tried to disbelieve it and not show it anyway. The hearts with antibody-mediated rejection seldom have short-term failures. And if you look in uh, survival analysis, ABMR scores per se actually are slightly positive. Uh, it's uncomfortable to say that. Don't, let's, not, let's pretend I didn't say that. They're not a risk for graft survival short term. TCMR is, and strangely, this minor changes. And so my theory is that some of these minor biopsies are represent ABMR, which is burning out as it develops deterioration of the parenchyma, and they're at risk because they, they have previously had active ABMR, but they don't have it now. Now, if we look at left ventricular rejection fraction that determines a left ventricular rejection fraction are the early injury phenotype and T-cell mediated rejection. And in both cases, time plays a role. Time increases risk in hearts. Anyway, that's what we're seeing. Some of it a little surprising. 
Okay, so here's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to take a look at the injuriness in every biopsy, heart or lung or kidney, and also independently look at the, the, um, at the, at the rejectionness. So rejectionness and injury separating out. And so each biopsy should get two independent phenotypes. And again, I'm trying to look at normal, um, recoverable injury, severe injury causing distress and probability of loss and atrophy fibrosis. Granted, I can't prove this is atrophy fibrosis in every biopsy, but it has the characteristics of atrophy fibrosis as we can see it in the kidney. So now we take the injury associated transcript sets, not the rejection associated. And these are parenchymal genes. There are many genes we've, we've uh, in, induced in experimental models like cardiac isografts, and when we look at the injury genes, we get principal component one, which is no injury, mild injury, moderate injury, and severe injury. And you don't want your heart to be over here. And then we get principal component two, which is the atrophy fibrosis phenotype, the late change. But this is, we conservatively call this late injury, and sometimes we call it atrophy fibrosis. And the, um, we haven't formally proven that that is the term we should be using for these hearts. The characteristic of these hearts is they develop immunoglobulin genes, which is the characteristic of kidneys undergoing scarring and also of lungs undergoing time-dependent changes and also of livers undergoing time-dependent changes. So that's what these biopsies have. We're coloring them by their injury archetype, no injury, mild injury, moderate injury, severe injury, and late injury. Okay, now when we get biopsies, we can get people to record the left ventricular ejection fraction. Over long time, the left ventricular ejection fraction, the probability, these are the left ventricular ejection fractions that are recorded. And uh, the probability, this is a, an estimate of the, of the uh, left, uh, it's a splined line which Jeff Reeve generated, which is an estimate that you have a left ventricular ejection fraction greater than 55. And you can see the optimal time for that is, is in the intermediate period of the heart transplant, slightly lower in the earlier and definitely lower in the later because of all these people. So left ventricular ejection fraction correlates with molecular uh, injury much more than with rejection. It's related to severe injury and late injury. So this axis is the proportion of biopsies with impaired left ventricular ejection fraction less than 55. This axis is the injury score for that biopsy. As the late injury and severe injury scores go up, the probability that that heart will have impaired function goes up as well. So severe injury and late injury correlate with the number of hearts that have impaired function. And if we do ROC curves, we see that injury alone predicts, is as good a prediction of impaired left ventricular ejection fraction as at injury plus rejection and is better than rejection transcripts alone. These aren't great predictions because uh, left ventricular ejection fraction isn't. We're not trying to predict the left ventricular ejection fraction. We're trying to predict the hearts that have, that have impairment of function. So is this late state, and close to 20% of the biopsies that we get are, have this late injury state that we call atrophy fibrosis. Is it related to cardiac allograft vasculopathy, coronary artery disease? And I'll give you a definite probably. Um, when people do biopsies, they don't, they don't consistently phenotype the coronary arteries. So we haven't much information about the coronary arteries in the interheart study. But the arteries are donor tissue and they're subject to the same stresses as the parenchyma. And the entity that they call CAV has many of the same characteristics as the entity we're calling parenchymal atrophy fibrosis. Does coronary artery disease cause the parenchymal change? I doubt it myself, but I'm a nephrologist. All I know is that the population of biopsies in which we're describing this late change is similar 
and it's 20% of the hearts. There's a lot of people out there with, that have some impairment with their hearts in the late period, and they're at risk, as you'll see. How is the injury change related to the um, rejection change? Now that as an immunologist has, has intrigued me for a long time. <laughs> so when we take all the hearts that have any T cell mediated rejection like change, 127 biopsies, and we take all the hearts that have antibody mediated rejection, no T cell mediated rejection, that's 340 biopsies, then we can look at the injury states that go along with the T cell mediated rejection and the injury states that go along with the antibody mediated rejection. 85% of the hearts have the severe injury and late injury state. Very few of them are normal if they've got any T cell mediated rejection activity. Many kidneys, many, many hearts with antibody mediated rejection, especially those early on, have an inj injury phenotype, which doesn't look much different from the time course of the, of the post-transplantation injury phenotype in all hearts. They really aren't showing in any injury, but late, they do. So the late, the late hearts with antibody-mediated rejection have a high frequency of the atrophy fibrosis phenotype. Antibody mediated rejection very seldom produces the severe injury phenotype. So now this is a little complicated. Uh, you might say that what else is new, but anyway, this is a little complicated. So this is log time post transplant. And what we're looking at on the y axis is the severe injury score over log time post transplant and the late injury score over log time post transplant and we're coloring the biopsy groups by their rejection state the biopsies with tcmr virtually always have some severe injury change the biopsies with abmr do not the biopsies with tcmr very early start to develop the late injury change the bias with ABMR do not, but then they do. The biopsies that we are calling minor also do. And you will recall the survival analysis showing that minor was not necessarily good for you. Well, that seems to be why. The biopsies that are we are calling normal and have no rejection do not. Okay, so survival in inter heart again is short term and um, histologic rejection is not associated with increased failure. Molecular rejection is associated with a mild increase, but it's on the borderline of statistical significance, but injury strongly predicts the failure, whether you have rejection or whether you don't. So in biopsies with no rejection and biopsies with rejection, injury produces, correlates with failure. So let me just walk you through this. These are the histologic uh, rejection phenotypes and, and there's no significant association. Although um, what, what you can see uh, is that uh, TCMR and mixed are bad for you uh, in histology. You get stronger associations with molecularly um, and the associations are with the early injury phenotype with the minor, uh, the, uh, the, with the minor phenotype, which is pink and with TCMR. But the strongest, the really significant associations are really with the injury phenotypes, especially severe and late. And if you take all the rejection biopsies out and look only at the rest of the biopsies, you still see the severe and injury states are bad for you. But don't be misled, some of these may have been produced by previous rejection. And then within ABMR, severe injury is a bad state to have. Within ABMR and within TCMR, the injury states are bad to have. This isn't significant because there are so few hearts that have no, um, no severe or late injury. So here's what we're learning in hearts. MMDX using rejection transcript expression defines gradients of the rejection states. TCMR is a highly damaging process. ABMR usually spares the parenchyma initially and may be well tolerated for months or years, but it leads to atrophy fibrosis. Incidentally, this is a big therapeutic challenge. 
how much risk should you put the patient through on the after you've read that sentence? And is it worth it trying to suppress something which for the we're, this little girl with a heart transplant um, may be uh, okay for, for four or five years. Uh, so how much risk do you want to put her through now? And that's, uh, I'm not minimizing that, um, the, the quandary that uh, clinicians are in about that. The minor state of subtle ABMR-like change in kidney and in hearts, incidentally, um, there's mildly increased ABMR transcripts, increased probability of DSA, and it's seen by the pathologist. And many pathologists call these biopsies TCMR1. DSA associations occur in gradients. 34% of fully developed ABMR is DSA negative in hearts. And DSA positivity occurs in a gradient from normal to minor to possible to fully developed ABMR. The parenchymal injury, we see this various uh, degrees of parenchymal injury. We see severe injury, we see injury producing parenchymal matrix and microcirculation changes. And those are injury up genes. We see dedifferentiation of the parenchyma and that's probably why these people are sick. The recruitment of inflammatory cells, especially in relationship to acute injury, the heart, is, the heart injury is very pro-inflammatory, possibly because of mitochondria lease, interesting enough. And then there's the atrophy fibrosis. And molecular injury is the major predictor of depressed function and short-term graft loss. Okay, so thanks to Kieran, we have a whole variety of lung biopsies to look at. And uh, he also developed this um, style of biopsy called the uh, 3BMB. And these are the people who've contributed biopsies and we're very grateful. Uh, we're having a lot of fun with these uh, centers and, uh, and thanks Edmonton for all you're doing in this regard. So we've got a lot of transbronchial biopsies, a lot of mucosal biopsies. Now the interlong study takes both of these and looks at them separately and then tries to learn the lessons overall about how lung tissue is experiencing its journey. So in modeling rejection, we use the, the rejection associated transcripts. To make a long story short, principal component one is the best estimate of T cell mediated rejection in, uh, in um, transbronchial biopsies. Principal component two, uh, um, archetype two is the best uh, definition of rejection in mucosal biopsies. We initially were quite concerned about, with biopsies that lacked surfactant but we got over it because now we can read principal component one in the transbronchial biopsies, even when they have no, no very little surfactant. In other words, they're not alveolated. So, um, and, and that seems to, be, um, seems to be reliable. Principal component two is more influenced by the degree of alveolation of, of the biopsy. In mucosal biopsies, we have four archetypes. And R2 is T-cell mediated rejection. R4 is a time-dependent uh, deterioration of the, of the uh, epithelium, which we'll come back to in a, in a couple of minutes. So that's how we breed rejection. This is the, this is the transbronchial biopsy, um, uh, which uh, doesn't really have much going on. It is not, does not have T-cell mediated rejection, but it's not completely normal. There are some slight abnormalities. Um, and because these are noisy biopsies, it's very difficult for us to actually ascribe phenotype to the biopsies that are outside the T-cell mediated rejection in the normal range. We have um, two models that we look at. And then the same person had a mucosal biopsy, and this mucosal biopsy is also showing very little change. And this is looking at the mucosal biopsy. And so we're mainly interested in R2, we're also interested in R4, but R4 only comes on late. And this is only 12 days, so the, the late change hasn't occurred. So the mycosal and the transbronchial biopsy are usually pretty close to one another in their terms of the re their rejection. It's not always, though. Okay, uh, can we detect ABMR? There is, we have a DSA classifier in lungs, which, which detects uh, a change in the DSA positive biopsies, which does not occur in the DSA negative biopsies. And this is an ABMR-like change. Its significance, we don't know yet, um, but, uh, but there is an ABMR-like molecular change associated with DSA. Okay, 
the big low hanging fruit here is CLAD. CLAD can't be read histologically. CLAD is a physiologic state and it was challenging to take on CLAD because finding a molecular state in tissue that can't, that can't be identified histologically that correlates with a physiologic state is no small challenge. However, we'll show you what we've got. The first paper was on CLAD in transbronchial biopsies has just came out. And what we find is CLAD is a severe injury state. It's a tissue distress state in the parenchyma. So when we do the volcano plot, we're looking at the association of individual genes, transcripts with CLAD. And we see uppers and downers. This is dedifferentiation. This is probably why the people have the physiologic state is they're dedifferentiating in their airways. This is the injury response. And some of these genes are very well characterized in tissue injury. Uh, I once had a, a um, whole research project and de devoted to insulin-like growth factor in kidney. <laughs> uh, but IGF-1 is, up, is increased. This is hypoxia-inducible -induce, factor 1A. This is the Nobel Prize from a couple of years ago, uh, the hypoxia-inducible factors. And it's, so these are injury-induced factors in the transbronchial biopsy. Many of these other genes are interesting too, but I won't uh, bore you any more than I'm boring you away. At any rate, when we then look at gene sets that are associated with CLAD and we do uh, a logistic regression in which we hold time constant, the gene sets which are associated with CLAD are associated with injury, the injury day three, injury day five. These are gene sets we annotated in isographs in mice uh, 15 years ago. Um, and they're, they're found generally in all tissues when they're injured, right after they're injured, and also fibrillar collagens. That's interesting in relationship to the problem of RAS in, uh, in CLAD. But uh, what we don't see is associations with atrophy fibrosis and associations with injury, with, with rejection. The, those are not the things associated with CLAD. We also see the CLAD up genes and CLAD down genes are associated with CLAD. So the genes we said are associated with CLAD actually perform as planned associations once time is corrected. So there are two things going on. There's a time change and there's a CLAD change. In um, This is a random forest to predict graft loss and the prediction of graft loss in TBBs is best with the CLAD associated genes, not with the rejection genes. And so the CLAD association, associated genes in transbronchial biopsies are associated with injury. There, many of them are, are expressed in cancers as well. Cancer is the wound that doesn't heal. So they look like, to some extent, they're generalized severe injury genes in tissues that are trying to remodel themselves but are at risk. The decreased genes have high, high correlations with, um, with the physiologic state. So it's dedifferentiation. It's not rejection or inflammation. The CLAD genes correlate with the stage that the clinician assigns, as well as correlating with the existence of CLAD. And, and that correlates with prognosis. So we would suggest that in transbronchial biopsies, the CLAD state reflects severe, um, severe tissue wounding and distress. Now, what about the airways? The CLAD, state, the CLAD genes in airways, we've done the same thing and this paper is being submitted, uh, hopefully uh, in the next couple of days. Um, the CLAD genes are associated with the same injury-induced genes that we've mapped in kidney, trans, in, in kidney isographs years ago. They're not associated with the fibrillar collagens, interestingly enough, because this is an epithelial tissue, tissue biopsy, much more than the transbronchial biopsy. There's a little bit of a gamma interferon response, but this, that, that's a feature of tissue injury in many uh, epithelial organs. And they're strongly associated with the CLAD up and CLAD down genes, which, but they're not associated with rejection. So it's really very similar, not identical, but very similar to what we've seen in transbronchial biopsies. And again, if you look at graph survival in random force, which are multivariate analyses, graft survival correlates mostly with the CLAD associated genes. They were trained on CLAD, but they correlate with graft survival.
Now we have clad classifiers in these tissues and the clad classifiers we, uh, we use, the clad classifiers don't agree completely with the physiologic state or with time and their predictions of clad. And the clad classifiers state that some biopsies that have clad have the clad molecular change, but some biopsies that uh, there is divergence between the physiologic state and the molecular state, which is which is intriguing, and uh, I think it's real. Now, when we look at survival, this, the time uh, the time uh, changes do not predict survival. Although clad is time dependent, it's what you have, the clad you have is what predicts your survival, not the time of the biopsy. And again, the stage in, in mucosal biopsies is predicted by the molecular change, not so the existence of clad and the stage of clad are both estimated by the molecular change. And the survival is estimated by the molecular change. Now, looking at the individual genes here, we have in the transbronchial biopsy some interesting genes. It's, 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 these, none of these overlap with what we see in transbronchial biopsies. But as you'll see that they have the same features, ubiquitous expression. They're not inflammation or rejection. They're often expressed in cancers. And many are increased in severely injured kidneys as well. And some are increased in transbronchial biopsies with CLAD as well. So watch the LOXL1, which is a very interesting enzyme, which is needed to remodel matrix that you're, that you're, um, that you're making. So it, it actually is an enzyme that acts on the matrix products. Okay, then when we look at, these are the TBB, the transbronchial biopsy genes. And if you look at them in the mucosal biopsies, they may not be the top genes, but many of them are increased. There's HIF1 alpha. If you look in the transbronchial biopsies at the, at the mucosal biopsy genes, they're also shared. There's LOXL1 in transbronchial biopsies. We had seen it as a top gene in the mucosal biopsies, but it's also significantly associated with GLAD in transbronchial biopsies. And then you look at the kidney genes that we have, which are associated with kidney injury. And, and many of these genes we have seen many times. And every time we are looking at prognosis in kidney transplants, we get NNMT. There it is in three BMBs. And so we took um, the, um, <laughs> this is a little off the wall. We decided we would look at the, kidney survival as predicted by the kidney expression of the genes associated with clad in lungs. Okay, these are the top 30 genes associated with clad in mucosal biopsies. When you don't have, when you have low expression of these genes, you do well. When you have high expression, you do badly. And if you look at LOXL1 in kidneys, Again, something from the mucosal biopsy and the transbronchial biopsy. If you have low expression of LOXL1, you're going to do well. And if you have high expression, you're going to do badly in your kidney transplant. Okay, so what we're learning about CLAD, and this is kind of exciting for us, CLAD itself increases with time. But the important thing isn't the time, it's how much CLAD you have. Time-selected transcripts are expressed in inflammatory cells and they are not related to CLAD. CLAD-selective increased transcripts are basically, they all share the same features. They're ubiquitous in parenchymal cells and they're induced in, in, in distressed tissues. Many are expressed in cancers. CLAD-selective increased genes are also increased in, many are increased in TBBs and in severely injured kidneys. CLAD selective transcripts and classifiers correlate with CLAD stage and predict survival. So CLAD emerges as a severe parenchymal injury state or distress state that shares features with other distressed uh, or uh, tissues. Okay, one just one minute. Um, the trifecta studies are giving us some interesting information. Trifecta is a, a set of an investigator initiated prospective studies in kidneys and now in hearts, in which we're looking at the relationship between cell-free DNA and HLA antibody and the molecular findings in the biopsy. 
The first double analysis of cell-free DNA versus the molecular findings in the biopsy showed that the top genes that correlate with cell-free DNA, the top gene expression in the biopsy that it correlates with the release of cell-free DNA, donor-derived donor cell-free DNA in the biopsy, are entirely ABMR genes. And overall, TCMR, which is active, also releases cell-free DNA. The correlation of, of cell-free DNA with molecular rejection is higher than the correlation with histologic rejection, but it's strong for both. And if the biopsy is DSA negative and has ABMR, and these are the blue balls here, this, is, this axis is cell-free DNA. This axis is the state of the DSA. So these are DSA positive or PRA high risk. These are DSA negative biopsies and the blue are ABMR. So the ABMR, which has no DSA, gives as much cell-free DNA as ABMR that does have DSA. PRA status doesn't matter. I won't go through this because of the time, just to say that uh, we're using logistic regression to, 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 to take the tests available at the time of biopsy and predict what's in the biopsy. And um, we have time, DSA, percent cell-free DNA, quantity of cell-free DNA. The AUCs go 0 0.61, 0 0.66. So DSA is only a 0.66 um, uh, AUC for predicting whether there'll be ABMR in the biopsy. Cell-free DNA is 0 0.84, 0 0.85. And the combination has, a, has an AUC of 0 0.88. So what we conclude is cell-free DNA is strongly related to active rejection. 50% of ABMR is DSA negative, but DSA negative ABMR releases as much cell-free DNA as DSA positive ABMR. In our paper that we have uh, under review right now, the um, cell-free DNA is molecularly essentially identical. As the, sorry, the um, ABMR is molecularly identical, whether it's DSA positive or DSA negative. It's just that the DSA negative has somewhat lower signals, but it's molecularly otherwise identical. And, and cell-free DNA predicts ABMR better than DSA does, although the best predictions use both. Thank you very much. Thank you all of you who have contributed to this study over the years. I'm really, uh, you can say I, I get excited about this stuff, but I'm really excited about working with all of you. Thank you very much. Great, thanks, Phil. Um, okay, so we do have several questions here in the chat. I, hopefully we can get to um, all of them, if not to most. So uh, the first one, I'll start with one from Andrew Masood. So he's asking what kind of patients, uh, variables or factors uh, we are looking at that might affect the MMDX uh, final diagnostic report, for example, comorbidities, age, sex? Well, whatever condition, can act in the biopsy will affect what we read in the biopsy, whether we were reading it with the microscope or the micro microscope. So when you think about all the covariates, think about how they would be acting in the biopsy. There are some uh, variables which I'd really love to know more about. And um, one is um, the effect of aging and, and don't laugh, okay? When I say I'm interested in aging. Um, the, the problem with age is, and, um, and it, well, the problem with aging is that it's a very subtle signal molecularly, and uh, we can't tell currently the age of a tissue. And if there was one piece of information that I think we'd all like to have more about is why the older tissues from donors perform so badly when we transplant them, and can we, can we predict that in advance? So we're trying to do that. Yes, covariates will affect the phenotype through the changes in the tissue. And some covariates we're not good at reading yet, like donor age. Great, thanks. Um, Andrew's second question is, uh, innate and adaptive immune responses work in harmony to modulate the host immune responses to endothelial injury. What types of control biopsies have been used to calibrate and validate the MMDX system uh, platform? Well, remember that we have uh, 70 to 80% of the biopsies we get have no rejection. Um, they all have injury, um, but the injury plays out, it's, it's universal. All transplanted tissue has been injured and it never forgets. But we see, uh, so, so the tissue acts as, its, as an internal control. 
And in fact, to get a pristine heart that has never been transplanted, it probably wouldn't be relevant as a control because we're not interested in the fact that something's been transplanted. We're interested in how, what, how it is doing compared to the best transplants. And that's really the internal comparison. So if you'd like to see the sorts of comparisons we can do, that, that would, we, can, we can show you that within the population, but that's where the action really is. The difference between the transplant and the tissue that's never been transplanted is, is mildly interesting, but to tell you the truth, that's not where the money is. Does that answer your question or does, does that sound evasive? That sounds good to me, yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, Andrew's third and final question is, uh, this is an interesting one. Would uh, the MMDX platform help with predicting the survival chances of genetically engineered xenograft transplants in the future, do you think? There's an opportunity for that. So, so, so we've gone back and forth with Bob Montgomery about this. Um, and uh, this would be a problem with that we, we would definitely do with RNA sequencing. Um, and the degree to which that's gonna be helpful really requires that you get some degree of success with the survival of the organs. Um, the organ from the, uh, one, one advantage of the, of the uh, xenograft is it doesn't have to undergo brain death, which is very damaging and, and permanently damaging to uh, all the tissue that has been through brain death. But, um, but we think that, there, that the problems of molecular phenotyping of the xenograft pale in comparison to the problems of getting xenografts to work beyond two or three months. So um, it's something we, we, would set, we will set up when there's demand, but it's not a high priority item right now. Intriguingly though, I would love to see the kinds of rejection that the xenograft gets, because I think that uh, from what I've seen of the microscopy, it's really different. And, um, but, but you need you need 10 of them, not one. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, we are at one o'clock. Are, are you okay to go a little bit longer and uh, answer some of these questions that we still have? Okay, maybe you- If you can take it, so can I. And, uh, okay, yeah, yeah, I have, yeah, I have a few more minutes. Maybe what I'll do uh, for those that do have to drop off, I'll just um, uh, make the closing announcements at this point, And then those that still have questions, we can hang on for another five or 10 minutes. So I just wanna say that um, next week's ATI seminar um, on April 13th, uh, we're pleased to have Dr. Frederick Darragon presenting the Synergy Pilot Trial Advancing Donor Care in the ICU. And I was also asked to um, uh, provide a reminder that the CDTRP has launched the Research Innovation Grant Competition for 2022. Um, and with the support of Paladin, the ATI is delighted to offer three additional awards specifically to Alberta-based research teams. And the link for that application deadline, I think, is, is will be available in the chat. Um, so with those housekeeping items out of the way, I'll go back to the questions here. So a good one from Sadie. Um, IGF-1 and HIF-1 both control metabolic signalings. Is there some metabolic metabolomic studies for this late injury state um, to see how uh, does that get altered? Uh, yeah, I'm sure you would. it would be productive. Um, the genes we see, for example, uh, Oxidative phosphorylation uh, goes down, uh, anaerobic uh, um, metabolism goes up, uh, all the solute transport goes wonky. Um, so you can almost, you can guarantee that metabolomics would see uh, changes in metabolism of the, uh, of the damaged tissue. It, you know, in general, tissue that's damaged um, uh, goes through some phases which have been called uh, Rubor, thormor, th thermor, et cetera, and functiolasa. And these ancient uh, observations going back to Hippocrates, you can see them molecularly playing out in the tissue in response to wounding. So the response to wounding, um, you can start to see uh, how the entire cell, the response to wounding is one of the most ancient responses in all of biology probably two and a half billion years old. If you're a multi-celled organism, you have to have this response and it's shared widely across the animal kingdom. And, um, and it affects metabolism. It's a whole strategy that the, that the tissue is going through and you have to try to understand it changes every day. It changes probably minute to minute. 
Um, and you have to try to, we have to try to get to think like what the tissue is thinking when it's presented with a wound. What am I going to do? Well, I used first intention or second intention. And to some extent, this is the sort of things that the surgeon sees every day when the, when they, when the surgeon is watching wound repair. Um, but it, it brings up a whole set of, of interesting problems about in medicine. How does a wound decide to do what it does? Who's the quarterback? And um, those are the things I think about when I should be sleeping. Yeah, there's a lot to discover still, that's for sure. Um, and did you want to maybe ask your question now? Yeah, thanks so much. Please. It's easier to talk than type. <laughs> um, thank you so much. That was a great talk. I learned, I understand this a little more every single time I get to hear you talk about it. So I appreciate that. Um, I have two questions. One is boring, but um, the first question is, I saw that you, you know, obviously included sex as a variable in your demographics for this lungs, for the recently published lung study. This might be a bit of a Kieran question too, um, but how often are women um, with who are getting lung transplants, to, how often do they have a pregnancy history? I know that's really true for kidney transplant patients, and I'm wondering if you saw um, any differences in, in sex between the transcripts um, as well as just, you know, like obviously you represent the, you show how many men and women were in the study, but was it, did you see anything emerge as a variable for difference for sex? Because I noticed in the kidney paper, the de novo DSA kidney paper, um, Olivier's paper that men were actually overrepresented in the de novo DSA group, which surprised me. Um, and then also just super boring question, HLA labs have a lot of work to do still to standardize how we report DSA, how we measure it, um, how we, you know, how we do all of that. Um, and this was a great topic yesterday in the STAR discussion at CIOT. Um, and I'm just wondering, is that a struggle for you in the studies? Because you have these multi-center studies, which are awesome. And then, you know, but you have a lot of different labs then contributing HLA data, I'm assuming. And how do you manage that? And how do you try to standardize that in your work? Thanks. Well, what we're, you know, it's like, in the trifecta studies, we have um, one lambda and Lewis uh, standardizing the output. And we're comparing that also to the output from the individual centers. And in the positives, there's a lot of, there's considerable variation in what they consider positive. And in the negatives, the negatives are really clean. There's 97% agreement between the local centers calls on negatives and the one lambda calls on negatives. So the variation between the uh, local center and the and central reading is not really the cause of DSA negative ABMR, but it is it does play out in the DSA positives and interpreting them and establishing risk. What we're going to do, Anne, and maybe you should uh, come and talk to me about this. We're we're going to, and this is with Lewis. We're going to get um, we're going to get involved with Dave Lowe in one lambda and. Um, and with Lewis and uh, with some of the other <clears throat> lab directors in HLA and have a look at recalibrating all of the readouts that are coming from the beads. And read, so now we've got a, an objective readout, the MMDX phenotype, which is quantitative. And now we can regress everything against everything else and see what signals are being missed or misinterpreted in the way the beads are being interpreted. So it's actually a great time. The other thing we're doing, and we're going to get into autoantibody. So we're going to get into the autoantibody panels in one lambda and see how autoantibody relates to the phenotypes in kidneys and eventually in hearts. So there's a ton of work to do. These are heavy, heavy duty analyses when you're comparing a high dimensionality platform with a high dimensionality platform you can imagine. Mm -hmm. So um, if you're volunteering to put in <laughs> 40 or 50 hours of work, uh, we welcome. <laughs> Sure, I'll help, and then we can throw some ABO in too for fun. <laughs> oh, sure, why not? Oh, okay. why not? <laughs> yeah. yeah, and did you see sex as a difference at all in this lung? Yeah, okay, so work? this that's a population problem that I would turn back to Kieran if Kieran is still around. Um, he may have had to go off to do something clinical, but um, but but I would turn that back to a population problem in the lung transplants is how uh, how um how sex uh, plays out, how pregnancy history plays out. Mm -hmm. It certainly must, yeah. but we see things ultimately influencing the, um, the phenotype of the person. And then the, so the variables interact with the phenotype, then the phenotype, phenotype interacts with the outcomes. So um, 
the number of events that we have is not large enough. Like you're probably asking questions where we need thousands of events and we have at the most hundreds. Yeah. Yeah, because we don't know the memory of pregnancy often, right? And so I think if depending on if they're older when they're getting transplanted and their pregnancy was a distant memory, <laughs> um, you know, that might be that might be different um, than, you know, obviously if someone still has circulating antibody, then that's like, you know, you're maybe just not crossing it. They may not be transplanted, but I think it's a really interesting question. And I just was really surprised by the findings in the kidney de novo DSA study that it was so male, you know, I think it was, um, I just looked it up while you were chatting. It was like 72 out of the 102 on the de novo DSA group were men. And I was like, well, that's interesting. It's the opposite of what I would have expected. So I just don't know if, yeah, yeah uh, well, it's like a see, whole conversation, but. <laughs> remember how you get to that point though, these people have all been cross-matched and a highly intelligent HLA director has <laughs> go or no go on the transplant. And so now you're looking downstream of a whole series of screening events upstream. And uh, it's hard to factor everything in. Yeah. I'm absolutely I sure that sensitization plays a role. And I'm also sure that the pregnancy sensitization is different from the other types of sensitization. And, and um, probably pregnancy, pregnancy is, a, is a, uh, a unique biological circumstance compared to the other ways you can be exposed to human tissue. Yeah. Depends how many times you're vaccinated with that pregnancy too, maybe. <laughs> how many boosters you've had. <laughs> Thanks for that discussion, guys. Uh, so we have a couple more questions and then one comment from Alim Herji. I think we can squeeze those in. So uh, one question here, kind of piggybacking off of your discussion from Colin Anderson, um, your thoughts on the nature of DSA negative ABMR. Um, yeah, obviously you're talking about autoantibodies and uh, um, yeah, as you mentioned, non-HLA non um, DSA as well. So uh, what are your thoughts, well, I guess? I... Okay, I hate to do this to you, but could I show, uh, could I screen share for a minute? Yeah, you, sh yeah, you should still be able to share your screen. Um, I may be able to find this. Or not. Um, my thought is, okay, I'm not finding it. Anyway, look, my thought is this. Uh, there are basically um, six reasonable theories for how someone could be have something that looks like antibody mediated rejection, but you can't find the DSA. Number one, the platform that we use doesn't detect the DSA that actually assembles into hexamers on the endothelium and, uh, and activates the NKFC receptor. The NKFC receptor is probably activated by multimerization. And it probably multimerizes around a hexamer or some other higher order uh, assembly of IgGs. And the three-dimensional structure of the complement binding uh, of, uh, of IgGs indicates that a complement that C1QRS assembles around a hexamer and the hexamerization is going to be very dependent on the determinant as well as the, and so that the assembly of the effector competent hexamer prompt to engage the FC receptor requires certain determinants probably be, being mobile in the plane of the membrane. The DSA measurement platforms that we have, which are outstanding and change the transplantation may not simulate the uh, the the way that that effector competent IgG complexes are assembled. So that's one theory. I just again, I play with that when other people are thinking about more useful things. But at any rate, we would like to see three dimensional structures of the assembly of IgGs on a, on a on a living membrane that that engage the uh, CD sixteen FC receptor. Number two is that uh, we, we have people, most of the people that are DSA, that are DSA, have DSA negative ABMR actually are PRA positive. So that looks like they're, they're, they're mostly sensitized, it's like two thirds are sensitized, which may mean we're not properly recognizing some DSAs because we don't have complete genotyping. Um, 
That can't be the complete explanation though, because it really, as far as we can tell, that really probably is not affecting very many cases. There is NK recognition of missing self and NK cells can recognize missing self. Probably that is important in a way, the way we recognize things like um, really distant foreign material with antibody responses, but it doesn't look as if missing self differs between DSA positive and DSA negative. So those are three considerations. Right now, I think that it's probably a platform issue that the, uh, that the antibody that actually mediates antibody-mediated rejection as a factor component is a small subpopulation of the existing circulating DSAs and that our platform does not adequately represent it all the time. That's, but again, you were trying to make stuff up for what could be an explanation for how you can have antibody mediated rejection without antibody. And that's one explanation. And why it's so common? It's surprising. 56% um, in MMDX, 51% in histology now in the prospective trifecta study have DSA negative antibody mediated rejection of all the antibody mediated rejections. So I sorry I can't have can't provide you with a with a better explanation than that. Thanks, Phil. Um, yeah, no, that's it's interesting. We have been discussing this issue more and more at our kidney biopsy rounds on Fridays, and yeah, it seems to be. I don't know if it's becoming more um, more prevalent or we're just more aware of it. But yeah, there's obviously we have a gap in our system that we need to close. I think this is a, an area where you can see Banff learning and where the pathologists are learning and they're developing more and more confidence for this. So the amount of DSA negative ABMR we're seeing recognized by histology has gone up like a hundred percent in the last two or three years. Yeah. Um, okay, a comment, it looks like a limb had to sign off, but he had this comment, um, just a thought given CLAD is not associated with rejection transcripts, we need to think about etiology. It is unlikely to be related to previous rejection since the bronchoscopies are indication biopsies at the time of graft decline. Maybe we need to be collecting additional uh, BAL information such as bile acid levels, respiratory infections grown, um, and then suggested that you guys can discuss that further offline. Uh, that's yeah, good comment. Um, and I think uh, clad, but I think clad is is a uh, a severe distress state that that may have been produced by previous rejection, and the rejection may have subsided, been treated, or uh, spontaneously gone away. And uh, I actually think rejection probably plays a plays a significant role, but it's only one of the factors I think that can bring you to this state. Okay, there's this one final question I can see in the chat. Um, would there be any interest in biopsies of organs prior to removal from donor as a snapshot measure of organ health going into the transplant? Uh, likewise, likewise, would baseline cell free DNA measures in transplant recipients be informative? Yeah, we're doing those things. Um, it's not helpful at the time of the indication biopsy, but it is going to be helpful, I think, uh, in helping making decisions. There's a wealth of molecular information in tissue that comes to you from at the time of donation. And the clinician is faced with some really difficult decisions and many organs are being discarded. In the United States, it may be um, that um, 3000 kidneys are being discarded each year that could be transplanted um, with, and they won't be the best organs, but they would probably be better than uh, dialysis. So you're raising a big issue of getting molecular information into the hands of clinicians at the time that it can influence their decisions to use or not use a tissue and avoid discards. Great. Well, th thanks again, Phil, for doing this and thanks for staying um, a little late. It's not every day we get this opportunity. So um, I think, yeah, I appreciate it. And, and so does everyone else that was on the call. So yeah, thanks again. And we'll thanks see you very next much, time. Man. Yeah, talk to you later.